lovely and uh, hi everyone um lovely to to be with you um virtually it's great to see so many people from uh different parts of the world um joining the call um thank you so much for taking the time um so as as Natalie said we've got um an hour or so together um for me to introduce you to uh to some to some content maybe some of these things you're familiar with maybe they're brand new um that's fine and then we'll have uh some some time for uh for q a at the end but to introduce myself so you know who is is talking talking at you for the next um hour or so so um uh, I'm Ruth and I split my time. I work for the Common Cause Foundation um, for, for three days a week and um, I freelance as a narrative strategist for the other two. Um, so Common Cause uh, is, is an organisation that focus, focuses specifically on, on human values, um, what that means for us as individuals, but also what values kind of um, add up to culturally and what that leads to in terms of the ways that we act and think um, uh, and what we believe about one another and the wider world around us. Um, so I've worked in social and environmental uh, change for going on 12 years, mainly in, in campaigning roles. Um, I've done the rounds of lots of the, of the big um, organisations uh, focusing on both human rights uh, development and uh, more recently environment and, and climate issues. Um, but I'm going to I'm going to start off by talking to you a little bit about some of my experience um, to help us kind of ground um, the, the, the wider conversation that we're going to be having about about values. So like most people who work in sort of social and environmental change, um, I've always been really preoccupied by by this question that you can see on, on your screen. Um, how can more people be encouraged to care about and to act on social or environmental injustice? Um, so I believe this is to be really important as in uh, getting more and more people to care about an issue, I believe is really important, even if you are adopting a sort of what's called an insider influencing strategy, um, tackling or, or trying to convince particular decision makers of particular policies or particular ways of working. I still believe that um sort of public engagement having the public on your side is 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 hugely important um but in my experience of of uh working in the world of campaigning i um was sort of considering the scale of the problems that we are uh, that we face in the world on on the one hand um but then i was looking at the tendency that we that we have to focus on on fighting for fairly small incremental policy changes um often driven by a real sense of of kind of urgency or needing to prove tangible impacts to to funders um and prioritizing working in that way over and above tackling some of the root causes um, for some of the really long term systemic challenges that, that we face. So I was looking at the challenges that we face on one hand and looking at the, the approaches or the ways that I was being expected to work as a campaigner on the other. And somehow this just wasn't wasn't adding up to me. And this gained uh, clarity for me in my head when I went to an arcade and played a game of whack-a-mole, which has uh, we could talk about the narrative implications of that game <laughs> for a long time, um, but it, it kind of dawned on me that it's very similar to the way that we try to make change happen currently. So it's this idea of um, uh, whack-a-mole whack, uh, for anyone who doesn't know it is a is a horrendous game where um, you um, are expected to hit a sort of plastic mole on the head with a plastic mallet. And it's a game of reactions. You're trying to hit as many moles as you can in a particular um, period of time. Um, and this, for me, felt really like what campaigning feels like, where you are considering how you can go about solving a particular issue, pushing back on a particular issue uh, in, in the best way, in the best, most effective way that you can, or you know how you can best kind of whack that individual mole. Um, but no matter how many times you succeed in, in winning one particular campaign, which is hard and you don't always do that anyway, 
there's another issue just around the corner. There's another mole which is just about to pop up. And it really got me wondering about, okay, well, what's underlying um, these problems? What is underlying these issues that are causing them to appear again and again and again? Um, this frustration led me to lots of, of kind of reading and reflecting. Um, and eventually it led me to the work of, of Common Cause and others who are focused on, on values and uh, what we call deep narratives. Um, so as a really brief introduction to, to Common Cause, sometimes called CCF, um, uh, Common Cause started life as, as a report. Um, uh, my colleague Tom Crompton was working at WWF at the time and was wanting to explore an alternative approach to creating change uh, based on an understanding of social psychology. So based on an understanding of what motivates people to show concern for a really broad range of social and environmental issues. Um, it started life as a report and then it sort of grew from there and now it's an established uh, not-for-profit. Um, I say established, there's only three of us in the team, we're super tiny, um, and what we focus on is fostering what we call values literacy, so an understanding of uh, what we can learn from the social psychology of values, um, and then experimenting or kind of exploring with different partners what bringing to life an understanding of values kind of looks like for, for our work. Uh, so all of our work is focused on, on social and environmental change and creating what we call the cultural conditions that are needed to, um, to create this kind of like flourishing environment for social and environmental transformation to take place. So this session is um, pretty jam packed. There's an awful lot, there's decades of, of research in social psychology into values. Um, absolutely impossible to cram that into an hour. So we're gonna be taking you through some of the highlights um, if you are left with lots of questions, that is absolutely fine. Um, we can we can take questions later, but I'm also uh, just an email away. And if anyone wants to join Values 101, which was the um, the course that that Natalie joined, you uh, you would be very very welcome to. So what I'm going to be talking about today, so I'm going to introduce the concept of, of values, and that is uh, um, as it is defined in the social psychological literature. Um, and we're going to explore some of the research findings um, that exist on, on how values interact with one another. We're then going to consider why values are so important when we're considering social or environmental change. And I will introduce you to two concepts um, called intrinsic values and extrinsic values. And then we're going to start to consider some of the implications of this research on, on our work. Uh, which, how, how does it apply? How can it help us do our work more effectively? So um, to kick us off, in much campaigning and, and sort of advocacy work today, we rely on a theory of change um, that, that sort of says that change happens um, when we focus on issue specific tactics. Uh, so it's this idea that a group of us over here are going to focus on housing justice and then a group of us over here are going to focus on animal freedom and a group of us over here are going to focus on uh, climate action etc and we're all going to work really really hard to solve our particular problem and that is going to add up to a transformed world where uh, suddenly all of these incredible visions for the future that, that we all hold are real and, and happening around us. Now, often this takes the form of defining a particular problem um, and then attempting to make people aware of that problem, um, stressing to them, you know, how bad it is. This is an awful situation. Uh, you need to take action and um, trying to rely on on what we feel is, um, uh, you know, people's empathy um, for either other others around them, animals or the, the more than human world. Um, when we work in this way, our work is often um, sort of defined by a set of measurable objectives um, related to particular programmes or particular projects that, that we're working on. Um, and this, this normally entails us kind of examining the factual basis for addressing um, a, a challenge and then engaging in debate about the best practical approach to achieving that change. 
but social psychology um, uh, and the research that has come out over the uh, the field of social psychology over the last 60 years shows us that there are really two limitations to this approach. So firstly, is something called the information deficit model. Um, and this means that although uh, we as, as campaigners often feel that it's a lack of understanding, um, that is the reason why people don't act or don't support the cause that we uh, feel so passionate about. So we want to give them all the facts. We're going to try and raise awareness. That is a, a, a term that you hear all the time in sort of campaigning circles. Um, um, it's this sort of sense of if only people knew they would behave differently, they would feel differently. Um, well, unfortunately, um, human beings just don't tend to make decisions in that way. Um, we we aren't partic we aren't as rational as, as we would like to think that we are, and actually, we 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 tend to make decisions largely due to how to how we feel, and often that is very very subconscious, um, tapping into the to the level of values and emotion. So just telling people the facts um, really isn't going to be enough to get them to support whatever cause it is that you're championing. The second um, uh, limitation that we learn about when we reflect on what social psychology tells us about how people are motivated is that organisations aren't sort of taking into consideration the wider culture in which their work takes, takes place. So this is sometimes called iatrogenic effects. Um, iatrogenic in the medical terminology is an effect, is an, is an unintended negative effect from uh, taking a particular uh, um, course of medical action. So either um, a medication or um, a surgery, something like that. It's an idea that um, uh, although that particular intervention could be really positive, there might be negative unintended consequences that come about. And we see this in our campaigning work. We don't tend to measure it, but there can be so there can be cases whereby we feel like we are acting in the most effective way for the cause that we are championing, but that actually we can be having unintended negative effects without even realizing. Um, sometimes we refer to this as as kind of winning the battle but losing the war. So. Before we go any further, I'm going to kind of really make clear what I mean when I'm talking about when I'm talking about values. Um, so in all of our work, we convey particular values. It's really inevitable. You might never have considered values before, but um, I can pretty much guarantee that you will have engaged values in in your communications work. Um, but there is an abundance of social psychological research that tells us that there are some values which provide a better source of motivation for engaging people with what is tend to be called uh, bigger than self problems. So issues that may not directly affect them, but affect the wider world around us. So when I use the term values, what I'm referring to is the principles or standards that we each carry throughout our lives uh, and that guide and inform our thoughts, our attitudes and our actions. Our values um, influence and are influenced by our experience of the society in which we each live. They help determine what is important to us and how we interact with other people and the more than human world. These values in the way that I'm speaking about values, the way that social psychology defines values is different to how we might understand uh, corporate values or our organizational values. This is much more about us as individuals, as human beings and what motivates us um, to, to, to act or believe or think certain ways. So at Common Cause, we use a particular values framework developed by an academic called Shalom Schwartz. So this colourful map that you can see here lists 58 values. Um, they are the, the individual um, kind of bullet points around the map. And then those 58 values are split into what's called 10 values categories. So these are things that you can see um, bolded in, in different colours. So universalism, benevolence, tradition, conformity, etc. So social psychologists identified these 58 values 
following decades of research and hundreds of cross-cultural studies. The 58 values that you can see represented on this map are the most consistently occurring human values when researchers asked what people value most in life. So this is held over nearly 100 countries, but like all frameworks, it's not it's not perfect. There are going to be things that are missing here. Um, uh, there, there are communities that um, social psychologists have not engaged with in terms of um, uh, building, building this map. So it's not perfect. We use it because there is a lot of data on it. It is the most widely used framework. It uh, forms the basis of um, the European Value Survey and the World Value Survey, which tells us the most um, about, about people's values across the world. So I'm going to introduce you to some basic facts about or basic principles about how sort of values work and how they interact with one another. Um, so values can be complementary to one another or they can be antagonistic. And this is shown visually on the map by the position of each of the values of the individual values items. So, for example, the closer they are, so these two values up here, equality, protecting the environment, they're next, they're next to each other on the map. They're very close together. Uh, that indicates that they are more complementary. And what that means is that it's it's more likely that one person is going to place priority on both of those values at the same point in time. But when they're further apart on the map, so here we've got protecting the environment in the top right and we've got social power in the bottom left. Uh, the further apart two values are, the more antagonistic they are. And what that means is that it's difficult, it's psychologically difficult for somebody to prioritise both protecting the environment and social power at the same point in time. And this holds, you can look at any values around the map, Let's look at um, accepting my portion of life, which is down in the in the bottom right hand corner. Um, that's complementary to the value of moderate, which is next door to it. Um, but it's antagonistic to the value of freedom up in the top left. Um, and we can say this in, when we refer to the positionality of any of these values, that that uh, relationship um, is consistent, whether two values are complementary or antagonistic. And that explains why we have this, this kind of spread of values. It's not a sort of random scattering. The, the positionality of each of these values is really, really important. So something else to consider is that everyone has access to all of the values on this map. Um, sometimes when we talk about values, we will make assumptions about the values that people hold. So we might say, well, you know, my uncle who comes to uh, Christmas and is always going on about the economy, for example, he sits down in this power category. These are the values that he cares about and he doesn't care about any other values. Now, that's not the way that values work for human beings. We as individuals, apart from potentially a very small number of psychopaths, we all have access to all of the values around this around this map. We may find that we um, we spend more time in certain areas, depending on our upbringing, um, our education, our faith, if we have one, if we don't, etc. But we uh, um, have access to all of these values and so we jump around depending on what um, cues what triggers we're experiencing in in our life so when we're thinking about social and environmental change there are two groups of values that we're particularly interested in intrinsic values and extrinsic values intrinsic values are inherently rewarding to us while extrinsic seek external reward or approval. So intrinsic values live up here in the top right hand corner of the map. They are the values that, compri that, compri that compri comprise, goodness me, benevolence, universalism, and sort of this half, the right hand side of self-direction. Those are intrinsic values. Extrinsic values live down here in the bottom left hand corner of the map. Uh, it's comprised of achievement and power, the values that make up those two values categories. Now, we're particularly interested in these two groups for a couple of reasons. Firstly, they're antagonistic to each other. 
uh, what we were just talking about. Intrinsic values are, are located or positioned in the top right of the map and extrinsic are positioned in the bottom left. They're far apart from each other on the map. So we know it's really difficult for somebody to hold extrinsic and intrinsic values to be important at the same time. The second reason why we're particularly interested in these two groups of values is um, that research has suggested, and there is a huge body of research looking at this, that when someone prioritizes intrinsic values, when they spend more time um, engaging those values of benevolence, universalism, and some of self-direction, um, they are more likely to report stronger connection to their community. They're more likely to engage uh, civically, so they're more likely to vote, they're more likely to volunteer. They're more likely to report higher levels of well-being, so they're more likely to be happy. And importantly for us as campaigners, they are more likely to show deeper levels of support for social and environmental policies. So importantly for us um, as, as campaigners and as communicators, whether someone prioritizes intrinsic values is the best predictor of whether they are likely to engage in pro-social or pro-environmental behaviors and attitudes. That is not to say that extrinsic values are bad and intrinsic values are good. Uh, we need a mix of all of them um, to be sort of well-rounded human beings. But we know that there is a particular importance to intrinsic values in bringing about social and environmental change. So when we're thinking about when we're thinking about change, there are two um, uh, groups of values that we are focused on, intrinsic and extrinsic. What the research suggests is that we need to be considering how we can strengthen intrinsic values throughout our work. And this is important for two reasons. We've talked about the fact that um, there is a correlation between people placing prioritization on intrinsic values and then showing deeper levels of support um, for change. Um, but there are a couple of other principles of how values work together that help us sort of cement um, this argument. So the first one is called the seesaw effect. Um, so if I show you a piece of communication which engages the value of, of social justice, which is up in the top right hand corner, it's an intrinsic value. The value of wealth, which is in the extrinsic uh, category of values on the opposite side of the map, that value is actively disengaged. And the same holds the other way round. So if I show you a piece of communication that gets you thinking about your social power, for example, in that moment, uh, the the um, the value of social justice or of protecting the environment or of equality or of a value that lives up in the in the top right hand corner of the map is actively disengaged. So values sort of act in a seesaw fashion. You can motivate helpful behaviour through extrinsic primes, so by getting someone to think about their money or their wealth or their power, but it isn't long lasting. It engages for a short amount of time. Um, and this is actually really problematic in the long term for this second pr principle called the workout effect. Uh, so the workout effect um, looks at how values um, respond when they're engaged over a long period of time. And what it finds is that values act like muscles the more attention uh, is drawn to a particular value, the easier it becomes for us to draw on uh, in, in future. Um, so if you, if you picture it like if you go to the gym and you only work out one arm, those muscles are going to strengthen and it's going to be easier for you to, you, for you to use those muscles in future. Values work in a very, very similar way. So the more that we engage, the more time we spend in a particular part of the values map, it becomes easier for us to engage those values in future. And so although we can encourage pro-social or pro-environmental attitudes and behavior through engaging extrinsic values, those values of wealth and power and success, et cetera, um, what we're doing is strengthening the power of those values in the long term, which we know has a negative effect. 
because the, um, uh, of that of that research finding that people that prioritize intrinsic values are, are found to be more likely to engage um, and, and show support for, for social and environmental policies. So if I asked you why you do the work you do, um, or, or you know what you feel the programs that you run, uh, why you feel that they are important, I'd imagine most of you would refer to the moral imperative for animal freedom. It's the right thing to do, and you feel that very tangibly. These same values um, are also prioritised by the majority of, of UK citizens. I'm going to be talking about UK data. Um, this data is replicated in, in, in different countries. Um, I don't have the stats to hand with me right now, um, but it's something that I can talk to you about another time. Um, so you probably do the work you do because you believe in, in, in justice, because you believe in, um, in the moral imperative for animals to live safely, freely, uh, in the way that they choose. Those are the same values that are held by the majority of UK citizens and actually citizens across the world, although we are unlikely to assume this. So the good news is, is that the majority of people do place priority on intrinsic values. So this is some data from the UK. So 70%, 74% of the UK population place importance on, on those intrinsic values. Uh, the problem is, is that we as campaigners and as citizens generally um, don't tend to, to believe this to be the case. We feel that, you know, we might believe certain things or we might feel certain things, but everybody else is, is really self-interested. And that um, infiltrates how we communicate with them. It maybe encourages us to use extrinsic values in our, in our comms to try and prime those particular values because we assume that other people hold them uh, to be the case. So as an organisation, um, we can consider the, the kind of values that we amplify in, in our own work. And we can do this in a number of ways. So we can look at how we frame our messages, how we can frame them in a slightly different way to elevate those intrinsic values. We can also consider what values are being strengthened through the, poli through the policies that we're advocating for. For now, we're going to just look at the uh, at point number one. We're going to look at um, look at framing. So I'm going to introduce you to to some examples. I'm going to give you some time to read two different texts, text A and text B. I'd like you to have a read um, of both of them and then consider what text is invoking intrinsic values and what one is invoking extrinsic values. So. Um, Some people find it difficult to read the text on the screen. So I've just dropped a, um, a link in the chat box where, uh, which you are very welcome to, to use instead of reading the text on the screen. It is exactly the same text. So text A and text B. I'll give you a couple of minutes, just have a read through. And I want you to consider which text is engaging intrinsic values and which is engaging extrinsic. So intrinsic, is values like social justice, equality, protecting the environment, care for our natural world, care for those around us. Extrinsic values are those in the opposite side of the map, things like wealth, social power, um, status, uh, preserving my public image, success. Okay, I'll give you a couple of minutes just to read these two texts. So text A.
Okay, could I have a, a virtual thumbs up from people if you've been able to read text day? Amazing. Brilliant. Thank you. Okay, I will move on to text B. Give you a couple of minutes to read that. Okay, and if I could ask the same thing, virtual hands up or virtual thumbs up, and you've been able to read through text B. Okay, brilliant. So text A, text B, different texts. Um, could you please drop in the chat box whether you felt it was text A or text B that was invoking intrinsic values? So those values of, of justice, protecting the environment, our love and care for the natural world and those around us. Brilliant. Yeah, spot on. It's, it's text B. Um, and we can see this. So I've highlighted some words here on text A, which um, show us where potentially extrinsic values are, are being engaged in this text. So we're being primed to think about the way we would the way we look, the way our culture wants us to look. Um, we're being uh, primed to think about our money, uh, thinking about saving money, reducing costs, prices. Um, we're being referred to as a consumer. So we're thinking of ourselves as, as somebody who um, buys goods. And text B. Oh. Yeah, text B. So again, so I've highlighted a few um, words and phrases here. So uh, there's this sense of, of all of us. We're being invoked to think that we are one. We are part of, of a bigger community, a bigger ecosystem reference to families, communities, the planet, getting us to think about those that we share this world with. Um, uh, there's mention of, of connection, of our shared environment, uh, collaboration, using words like everyone to, to remind us that we are not a standalone individual and leaving us thinking about a thriving planet um, uh, for those of us now, but also for generations to come. So yes, I think you're absolutely right. Text B is that text that engages intrinsic values. Text A is engaging extrinsic. We're going to be able to talk about this in, in detail. Um, I'm looking forward to hearing your questions, but I'm just going to uh, take us through one final point. And this for Common Cause is, is the real crux, I suppose, of, of, of why we advocate for this approach. Um, so as well as invoking intrinsic values to make our own messages, our own communications more persuasive, more powerful for people, I, I would argue and Common Cause argues that there is a bigger reason uh, for thinking in this way um, and recognising uh, the, the kind of importance of engaging intrinsic intrinsic values through our work and through our through our communications. Um, and that is because of our our work um, plays a part in reinforcing and establishing the kind of wider culture in which we live. And in, in that wider culture is ultimately um, where we see our campaigns uh, succeed or, or fail. So I'm going to expand on that just slightly. 
So at the moment, we live in a world which is constantly foregrounding and exercising our extrinsic values. Uh, we receive thousands of messages um, every day, week, month, year that champions our extrinsic values, that we should be thinking about money and our wealth. We should be thinking about how we look. We should be thinking about our success, et cetera. We should be thinking um, and acting in a way that consumes more and more and more. Um, but as we mentioned, and as I mentioned earlier, values strengthen over, over time. So the more that um, these values, these ex extrinsic values are being engaged for us, the stronger that they are becoming and the more likely we are to draw on them when we're making decisions in the future. So when we're deciding how to act, when we're deciding who to vote for, when we're deciding what to believe, we, um, we, we will fall back on values that are, that are strong for us. And this is a real problem when we think about social change, when we think about that, that relationship, that antagonistic relationship between intrinsic and extrinsic values. So what Common Cause argues is that uh, any organisation that is seeking social and environmental transformation has a duty, has a responsibility to engage those intrinsic values through their work, to strengthen those intrinsic values through their work not just because they are the values that are going to make our own communications more persuasive, but they are the values that we need to see strengthened across our culture to create those conditions, to create that public demand um, that is so needed for social and environmental change at the scale that is required. So we refer to this as a rebalancing. We need to... Um, uh, not eradicate extrinsic values. They're still important to, to us as humans and we need them. Um, but to be more balanced, to make sure that people are able to access, exercise these intrinsic values uh, more steadily. And actually what research shows is that people really want to do that. They really want those intrinsic values to play a more impor important part of our, um, of our, our kind of public realm, which for me is super encouraging. So um, to, to, to wrap us up before I sort of launch into questions, um, when we work in recognition of values, we're not only making our own um, immediate work more effective, um, support, you know, hopefully engaging more and more people in, in our cause. We're recognising our role in shaping and reinforcing the culture in which we live and helping to create those cultural conditions that are needed to lead to durable and, and systemic change, which for us is, is hugely important and isn't something at the moment that many organisations um, uh, uh, are particularly focused on. Um, so if this is if this is kind of whetted your appetite, if you've if you're interested to learn more about this approach, there's numerous ways that you can do that. Um, so there's the Common Cause Foundation website, which has a ton of um, reports and guides, resources on there, which you're very welcome to to delve into. Uh, the one that I would particularly pick out is the Common Cause Handbook. It's a fairly um, robust sort of starter pack. Uh, for somebody who is, is um, first engaging with this concept of values. And um, as um, we mentioned earlier, there's also Values 101, which is a, our sort of flagship workshop. We run it about five times a year. Um, it's, it's public, it's open for anybody um, who has an interest in social and environmental change. And we, we take you through um, lots of what we've taken you through, what I've taken you through today, but in much more detail um, with some other kind of research findings um, drawn out too. Um, Values 101 consists of um, two hour workshops um, every week for five weeks. Um, we're running them again in, in October and November this year um, and then it will come back in in February we run them um, at different times uh, different days of the week every time we run um, a series so that people from across the world in different in different time zones um, are able to join I believe the October training is US friendly if you're east coast um, uh, November is is more kind of Europe Europe friendly time wise. Um, but if you're outside of those time zones and you would like to attend, do let me know. I have like a kind of running list of people that are interested in different parts of the world, and I refer back to that when we're setting uh, the times for for future for future sessions. 
okay I sped through that um <laughs> it's a lot of content um I'd love to be able to open out uh to questions now if if we can if that's okay with you Natalie yeah thank you so much Ruth. that was amazing and yeah this is really only scratching the surface of what value is about so I really encourage people to either read the handbook or do the course um, I'm trying to remember is it five or six weeks the course Ruth? Really? Five. five yeah yeah and it really just goes in depth um you bring in loads of science and studies and research and just the getting to speak to other social justice communicators as well is just invaluable um so yeah I would invite people to either send a message in the chat if you'd rather not ask the message directly or you know turn on your camera and ask brief directly hopefully you've all got lots of questions lots of um information that's been shared so yeah feel free to put up your hand and um I'll invite people to to speak up um thanks Melda thank you Melda that's um that's really brilliant to hear I'm glad you found it interesting and it is it is um it's a very common response uh um from people that that come and do values 101 to really reflect on you know why they why they chose the career that, that that they chose often we're very motivated by our um often intrinsic values for people that work in this sort of space and we you know we didn't really we've never really named that and often we find ourselves in positions of tension where we're being expected to work uh you know or follow certain approaches or work in certain ways within organizations that don't really align with our intrinsic values and that can lead to a lot of um what's called cognitive dissonance so this feeling of like unease of tension um so yeah i have spent a lot of time talking with people about their career choices um after values 101 thanks Amanda. Um, does anyone else have either a comment or a question you'd like to put to Ruth? Daniela? Hi. Hi, thank you so much. Thank you, first of all, Ruth, that was amazing. Um, it, for me, particularly, it was the first time hearing about this. I mean, I think we we already we were already using values but not knowing that we were doing that so i think my question to you is don't you think it's possible i know you talked a lot about they them they being antagonistic but um some somehow i think we try to include all in our communication and maybe that's a mistake so we try to include those intrinsic values but at the same time empowering the person and i can give you an example so it's like take action today, you're going to help millions of animals, only you can do this. So in this quick example here is like, you bring the world the necessity, the thing that you're helping uh, animals, environment, whatever it is, but on uh, with the way that you conduct the, the tax, you, you empower the person saying that only they are capable of doing so. So I don't know, I always thought that they were complementary in that sense, but can you talk a little bit about this you think it's possible to bring yeah. everything in the same copy yeah oh really good really good question daniela and um yeah such a common comms tactic i think when we're when we're trying to engage people um so a couple of things spring to mind so firstly um there sometimes we can get a, a little bit muddled with how we're thinking about values and uh, that's that's not made easy by the fact that the social psychology literature has like a very specific definition of of what is included by values whereas values as a word is sort of thrown around in our like public rhetoric um you know all the time so Firstly, I would say that there is a difference between values as a characteristic and values as a motivation. Now, I'll, I'll explain a little bit what I mean by that. So the social psychology is interested in values as a motivation, not as a characteristic. And the difference is um, I'm going to ask you to picture um, uh, Nelson Mandela in your mind. Now, he is somebody who was really motivated by those intrinsic values. You know, that's he gave his 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 whole career, his life was hugely um, uh, determined and influenced by those intrinsic values. Now, we could say that he was also someone who had a lot of success. He had a lot of he had a big public image. 
he might have even had a lot of wealth, I don't know, um, kind of off of the back of um, uh, the way that he lived his life, driven by those intrinsic values. So we could say that his motivation was intrinsic values, but he could be described as someone uh, who had a characteristic of sort of success or public image status, something like that. Whereas if we think of someone like Donald Trump, um, and I don't know Donald Trump, so I might be wrong, but um, I can imagine that Donald Trump is someone who maybe is really motivated uh, um, because of f four extrinsic values in and of themselves. His motivation is success. His motivation is wealth. His motivation is power, etc. It's not those things aren't characteristics for him. Those are his end goals. And so when we're talking about values, we're thinking about those intrinsic values we're thinking about motivations so somebody can be um in that in your example daniela of sort of um you know take this action you're going to help etc the motivation i would argue is probably still intrinsic values um but somebody might have a characteristic of then having you know made themselves feel a, a little bit better i've done something good today so that's not necessarily a bad thing um what the other thing I would say is that we have to be very careful when we're constructing our comms as to what values we're engaging. So there are different ways that people could respond to uh, or, or, or an organisation could change their tactic when they're thinking about values. Um, one of those is to um, be heavily influenced by a sort of social marketing um, approach which would be to um, try and see, OK, well, we think our particular audience are really motivated by extrinsic values, hedonism values. You know, all that they care about is having good time or all they care about is getting more money. And so we are going to try and sell or persuade that audience to engage with our work through speaking to those values. So you see this a lot in um, an environmental campaigning where it's like, buy this buy this uh, environmentally friendly car and you're going to look super cool and sexy and speaking to those sorts of values, but trying to do something intrinsic. That's one way you can respond. The second way you can respond is what I often call like throw spaghetti at the wall is sort of just engage everything and hope something sticks for somebody. And this, I think, is often what organisations do. They engage intrinsic, they engage extrinsic, they engage every value they can think of, and they hope that something jumps out in that comms for the individual. Now, what has happened is in the research is that um, people firstly feel like that sort of comms is, is inauthentic. They're kind of like, what are you standing for here? I don't really understand what, you know, what is your motivation for telling me this thing? Um, but more importantly, the comm shows that, and I think this is probably due to the cultural setting that we're in, um, culturally, extrinsic values are, are so strong that when we read a text that has a bit of everything in it, it's extrinsic values which are the most prominent. They jump out the most for us. And so uh, in a text that that primes a bit of everything, it's likely to be um, extrinsic values that are, the, are sort of the sticker. So we say we should do intrinsic values in all of our comms. And it isn't Joe uh, will, will engage everything, but as long as intrinsic's in there, it's okay. It specifically engage intrinsic and do not engage extrinsic. Um, I think with your example, Daniela, of, of kind of um, making someone feel empowered, that's probably more to do with the framing um, of, of how extrinsic that is as to whether you did it or not. Um, you could talk about... Um, you can remind somebody of the importance that they place on those intrinsic values through reference to, um, you know, the world around them, um, animals, um, the importance that animals have for our kind of ecosystem as a whole, etc. And then um, invite them to join your, you know, you know, join with thousands of others across the world who are taking action today, et cetera. It's, it's extrinsic, but it's, it's intrinsic, I mean, but it's sort of still got that empowering aspect. It's reminding people that they are one of many in, in a way that um, is maybe slightly different than focusing just on them. Um, that's what I would 
that's what I would say. Those are the things that came to mind from your question anyway. Thank you. Um, Jeremy, I think you had a question next. Yeah, um, I uh, apologize. I did join a bit late, so I apologize if any of this was covered. I look forward to watching the um, the video back, though, because it's a fascinating subject. I mean, communication, especially language, is just that's 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 my jam. So, um, the intrinsic versus extrinsic thing I find quite interesting because I think when we look at motivating people, um, there's so many things we can speak to, and I guess a few things like yourself, Ruth. It sounds like a few things kind of come to mind when we're in, in trying to unpack these massive subjects, but. I guess if we're appealing to someone for extrinsic things, is that going to be like a lasting motivational moral change? Um, and and I guess alongside that, you know, a common thing I think that's done in the animals movement is to to appeal to the 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 holy trinity of the of you know animals, earth, and health. And I'm I'm just worried if by you know your your example of throwing spaghetti at the wall, if we're actually diluting the message a bit when we do that. And um, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, really great question, Jeremy. Um, so I'm going to take your the second half of your question first. Um, that's it's super interesting that you said that that like there's this that potentially there's a there's a sense that we're diluting the issue area if we if we sort of combine um, uh, animal freedom with any other type of issue area that we might talk about. Um, I, I completely understand why you feel that way. And that is often, uh, I mean, it's the way that we have sort of designed civil society across the world is to be kind of like, we're going to work on this issue over here and then we're going to work on this issue over here. And um, sometimes we'll collaborate if there's some direct policy overlap, but otherwise it's it's almost a world of competition whereby, you know, I'm trying to speak the loudest to the public to get them to realise that the problem that I work on is the most urgent and the most awful and they need to give our, you know, give me attention so that, uh, or give me money or whatever it might be. Um, encouragingly, that's not actually how sort of social psychology works that's not really how we as human beings um understand issues um so there is a, a another kind of element of of um research which we cover in values 101 but we haven't gone into detail here um called the bleed over effect which is a really horrible name for something that uh i actually think is is really powerful and this is again it, it refers to the positionality of those values on the map so values that are very close together people can hold to be very important at the same time so actually, what has been found is that when somebody reads a text, um, say it's talking about the environment, they can read a text that's intrinsically primed, getting them to think about their love for the natural world. And then they can be asked to support a disability rights organisation. And they will be more likely to do that than if they were to be given a text that was extrinsically talking about um, the benefits of, of supporting disability justice. So it we're not um, our kind of the way that we approach issues as individuals is is much um, more sort of blurred than how we approach it as campaigners. Um, people, everyday people, when they are, um, are reading a piece of comms that is priming their intrinsic values, they will they will understand the connections between maybe not on a pragmatic sort of policy sense, but the values that underpin their care for the environment and their values that underpin their care for health and their, uh, the values that underpin their care for the environment are the same values. And so when you strengthen one, you sort of strengthen them all. Um, so there's a whole body of, of work um, that, that talks about um, no causes in Ireland. And there's a, a, a research report on our, on our website about this that actually we have come to separate out causes um, very deliberately in our work, but that's not supported by the, social by the social psychological literature and how we as human beings actually um, care for numerous things at the same time, which, um, yeah, I, I find really encouraging. Um, and the first half of your question, I'm now going to have forgotten what it was, was... You remind me, sorry. Yeah, you know, I appreciate it as a two-parter. didn't mean to say that <laughs> on you. Um, I guess just like when we're looking at the motivations, like, and, and I guess it goes back to the second part of the question, if the motivation is, you know, I want to lose weight, like if we're not doing it 
for our fellow animals, then are we actually doing it for not just the right reasons, but you know, from a psychology perspective? Yeah. Um, I, my understanding is the research that's very limited, but that's the most powerful motivator there is. You know, and and I don't know. Some people might start the dietary aspects of veganism and actually gain weight. You know, and all of a sudden they were told to do this for their health. They're gaining weight, and if they're not doing, you know, if they don't have the right why power, um, you know, will, will this, the 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 change be sustainable and really connect on a deep moral level that I think is necessary, yeah. not to just do it for a week or a month or a year, but you know, for a lifetime. Yeah, absolutely. So. Um you can prime people through or you can get somebody to behave in a certain way or to take a certain action through engaging their extrinsic values so you can say you know you're going to look really great if you become a vegan like you're going to look as the sexiest you've ever looked etc that could make somebody engage with your campaign that could make them adopt the behavior that you are encouraging them to adopt but what it does is it strengthens a particular set of values which are um, a counter to the values that we need to see strengthened at that cultural level um, uh, for kind of systemic support for um, social and environmental policies. So what would happen is you engage them through an extrinsic prime. There might be a small take up in um, in, in behavior. They might uh, you know, recycle or whatever it might be that you're encouraging them to do. But uh, that is soon going to kind of plateau out again. Whereas intrinsic values, if we're engaging for intrinsic values, what we're doing is strengthening those intrinsic kind of muscles, um, making it easier and easier for people to um, refer back to those values when they are making a decision. And I'd say refer back to this is never a conscious process or very, very rarely a conscious process. This is something that people are doing very automatically. Um, and also feeding a culture in which we are a group of people, we are a society that believe that um, treating animals with respect and dignity is the right thing to do. And we're sort of creating that culture in which any decisions, any institutions that we build, any policies that we make, any laws that we pass are done in a culture where that narrative is really powerful. Um, and that has much longer lasting um uh, uh kind of power i guess so yes there there is a sort of there can be a short term gain in in engaging through engaging somebody through extrinsic values but that has long term negative implications for for our work um i'm always trying to find a different um metaphor because i don't really like the the imagery that comes with losing um like winning the battle but losing the war but that is the kind of that's the kind of idea that that I guess um I'm I'm getting at thank you thanks um Jeremy and yeah just in kind of relation to that point I remember you saying to me Ruth during the course in the course the 101's values course I was asking about testing because that's something we're going to be doing at Animal Think Tank and asking about you know, testing certain values and that through testing it, extrinsic values messaging might actually show to be more persuasive than intrinsic, but we should never kind of go with what seems more persuasive if it's extrinsic, because it's going to be that thing of short-term gains, but long-term it could really hinder us over time. So yeah, I really took that away from the course. Um, we do have a question from AIM, apologies if I'm not pronouncing your name correctly, but um, I'll read it out unless you want to jump on and ask Ruth directly. Um, I'm happy to go ahead and read it. Oh, were you going to speak again? Yeah. Um, so first, sorry that I cannot open the camera, but I'm in the state that way it's better to be off. So my question is, um, I'm not sure if it's like a practical to answer, but do you think that these strategies can be applied to the Eastern world as well, because as we know that in cultural psychology or social psychology research, mostly focus on population from the Western world and have like specific characteristics that are shared, which is really, really small um, percentage compared to other sites, like other parts of the world. And I, I personally, uh, cur I'm curious that um, if I would like to apply these uh, strategies and findings in countries like, for example, in Thailand, is there anything that I can 
uh, look out or keep in mind, something like that. Thank you. Yeah, a brilliant, a brilliant questioning. Thank you. Um, so, well, I guess there isn't there isn't a um, a clear cut answer for this um, because any research, any framework has its limitations. Like this is not a, 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 a sort of silver bullet, unfortunately. Um, I think the, the, the issues that we face globally are, are far more complicated than any framework that we could apply. So these are principles and I think they sit alongside lots of other best practice in, in communications and public engagement. Um, but having said that, so um, the social psychology research base in which this framework uh, it, it kind of comes comes from um, is has has looked at values um, and gathered information about what people value in just under a hundred countries across the world. Um, those span um, uh, Europe, North and South America, Africa, and Asia. So. They, they have data on what people value from, from all parts of the world, and it is surprisingly consistent um, what people value. Where, where we differ, so let me just, let me just get up um, the picture of the map, because I see the map in my sleep, but um, <laughs> you guys might not. Um, So um, all of these values have been found to um, uh, be important to people from all different countries. So in every country where there has been um, research done around this, so just under 100, and those are across different continents, um, these are the values that, that most consistently come out as being important. Where cultures differ is um, the prioritization that they might place on certain values. So for example, in the UK, benevolence values, this group here is one of the intrinsic values categories, are the most important values for people. They come out as number one nearly every time. Um, these values are, are just are super, super powerful for people. Um, but that might be different to the, the value group that comes out as being the most powerful for uh, people in, in Thailand or people in Mexico or people wherever. Most of the time, benevolence values is number one from every data, from most of the data I've seen. I think it is Rwanda that is the only country that doesn't prioritise benevolence values. Um they, it's still important to them, but I believe they put more priority on tradition. Now we could speculate as to why that is, um, but and and I, I might I'm not the last time I looked at that research was a couple of years ago, so it might be out of date now. Maybe there's maybe there's differences and COVID that could have made some real impacts for people across the world, etc. Um, but what I'm trying to say is this framework roughly it's not perfect um, can be used across different countries. Where I think there is um, more sensitivity is um, in countries that have um, maybe a more authoritarian government. So in cultures whereby perhaps there is more stress on conformity and tradition values, for example. Now, we, have, we, we don't really talk that much in, in, the, in this session about the other, the other groups. So I've, I've spoken to you about self-direction, universalism, benevolence and achievement and power. Those are extrinsic. The top ones are intrinsic. Um, often people will ask, well, what about all these other value categories in, in the corners? Like, what can we do about them? And sometimes um, when I've worked with with activists in different parts of the world. So, for example, I've done a, done a lot of work with activists in, in Venezuela, in Hungary, um, different sort of political climates. Conformity and tradition values are often very powerful for people. And so people are, are wondering, well, what happens if we prime those, etc.? So um, it, it can be applied. Um, there are going to be differences. And one of the limitations of this framework is that it has come out of the Western social psychological kind of tradition. Most of the people that have worked on, on building this framework are white, male, you know, Western 
um, uh, professors. So very, very educated. Um, you know, that's not, there will be biases that have crept in to, to this framework. And we have to acknowledge that. For example, as far as I know, this has never been researched alongside indigenous communities. And I think that would have a big effect on, um, on, on the data. So it's not perfect. Um, but in terms of its kind of top lines um, that most of us across the world seem to value this selection of, of values, we seem to jump around um, this kind of this map um, and we find it difficult to prioritise both intrinsic values and extrinsic at the same time. That seems to hold kind of culturally across the world. And so we work with activists in, in different parts of the world um, who are working in very different political, economic, social contexts. Um, and uh, yeah, there's there's various degrees of success um, in, in each of those, but they all come with their own, their own kind of um, questions and, and complexities. I hope that helps. Yeah, thank you for answering. Um, Laura, I see you have a question. Yes, hello, um, Ruth, thank you so, so much. It was very eye-opening, very, very much so. Yes. Um, I do activism work in both the UK and in Turkey. Um, and my question is how you said we need to strengthen the intrinsic um, values, messages in our communications. Um, my problem, what makes me question that is um, how do we do that without sounding so preachy and in our uh, moral high horse because in my experience I found um, I've been I think vegan for almost 10 years um, I draw people in through extrin extrinsic values you know health um, clear skin um, you know fitness beauty um, and then once they get hooked in, I expose them to intrinsic values. And I know that sticks. I know the intrinsic message sticks. Um, but how would it work the other way around if I, you know, in my experience that hasn't worked um, uh, for me, I've done lots of student activism, but how, how can we do that without sounding um, preachy and, um, you know, morally, um, yeah, morally preachy, I'd say. How? What's your top tip? It's a really good question, and um, yeah, something that I think people come up against when when trying to implement this kind of approach in practice. Um, it can be, it can, you know, there's there's a risk of it being preachy. There's a risk of it being like, all we need is love and kindness, which I think can make people feel that's that's just so wet and soppy and that can't possibly be the answer to the huge huge challenges that we face globally um so completely understand the the hesitation um i'm gonna um show our trust you map again um so i think there's a couple of ways um around that part partly it's it's a framing issue being able to uh, engage um universalism values in a way that doesn't sound preachy that sounds um uh, really authentic and uh, reminds people of um the values that they already hold um so it's not saying like um you know, don't you care about uh, animals or don't you care about the world around you or whatever it might be, um, but but reminding them of but of care they already place. So saying something that's much more about, um, um, you know, we as um, we as as people um, uh, have some of our happiest moments in in nature for example or something like that that's still an intrinsic frame but it's framed very differently um i would also say that something that we really uh, a trap that we fall into a lot as campaigners and i have done this for my whole career um is 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 focus on these universalism values and only those that is um you know partly because we ourselves are probably motivated to do the jobs that we do because we are really motivated by these values, these intrinsic, uh, these universalism values. And so we, we sort of go in with these like really big grand messages about like, well, this is just, and this is moral and this is right, et cetera. Um, which I think can really be infuriating for, for a lot of public. Um, what, 
I I love about intrinsic values is that there is these other ones too. There's benevolence and there's self-direction. Those are also intrinsic values. They do the same job as universalism values, but they allow us to talk about issues in a slightly different way. Um, in a with a different framing so um you know sometimes in our training we play a game um called values sushi which um allows us to uh to to get someone to be thinking about a message that they want to send and then they have a pack of cards that has the list of of all of the intrinsic values on and they pick a card and if they get the value of um let's say creativity they need to think about how they frame their message using that intrinsic value of creativity or maybe they get the value of loyal, et cetera. It's a good way of trying to stimulate um, ideas for different types of messaging that pull on intrinsic values, but aren't the constant ones that we always draw on, which are probably protecting the environment, unity with nature, a world of beauty. Um, last point um, is something called the benevolence pivot. So what we see in uh, more sort of right-wing messaging often is that um, um, an audience member will be primed to be thinking about benevolence values and benevolence values are, are the love that we have for our friends, our family, our local community. So the sort of us, I guess, people that we would consider to be like us. Um, we'll be primed to think about those and then um, uh, the comms will pivot down into thinking about tradition and conformity and into security values. So you see this an awful lot with um, messaging in, in the UK, for example, and also in, in the US uh, around refugees. So but there'll be this sense of, um, you know, look at the beautiful community you live in. Isn't it wonderful that you get to uh, be in this in this great place? Um, this is at risk because of, um, you know, uh, illegal migrants or illegal refugees coming over, etc. We need stronger refugee um, policies, laws, whatever. Um, what what is a is an opportunity for those uh, more progressive communicators to do, and isn't something that happens often, is to pivot the other way. So to prime benevolence values, remind people of the love that they have for their friends, their family, those around them. So in the terms of animal freedom, this could be pets. This could be pets. This could be animals that we see on our commute to work every day, you know, animals that we see in our local parks, whatever. And then expand that circle of us. So universalism values are values uh, is is the um, the love, the admiration that we feel for those that are, are further away from us. So people that we wouldn't necessarily include in our us category, um, but we can ex extend that social of care, that, that circle of care. So we can prime benevolence values and then pivot outwards into talking about other animals or other people or other environments, etc. That's another comms tactic which um, we can we can use, we can employ to try and shake up our um, the way that we frame those intrinsic values and, and get a little bit more creative. And benevolence pivot is particularly can be particularly powerful because so many people place importance on benevolence values. Um, I hope that helps. That, that, that was amazing. Thank you. Uh, so um, you would say starting with benevolence values prior to all the other intras intrinsic values is more effective it can be it's not so there's there's very little research on the power of benevolent of, of the of the possibility of the benevolence pivot it's still a fairly new tactic i suppose that's being explored um i i think if you think about those around you those in your life people you know most people the thing that they care most about is their family their friends and their family you know maybe their house like where they live um those are really important to people and they that that plays a big part in how we act um what we think and feel what we believe etc so there can be a sense of uh it can be quite quick to remind people of that by priming intrinsic uh, by priming benevolence values and then what we're wanting to do is sort of expand that circle of care out into uh, people that maybe don't live near us, don't look like us, don't share the same faith as we do, whatever it might be, or, um, you know, um, animals that maybe we've ne we'll never see in our life, for example, um, don't have a personal connection with. 
so that yeah it's it's a it's a possible tactic i'm not saying that priming benevolence values is is necessarily going to be more effective than priming self-directional universalism but i think for many communities in different cultures across the world benevolence values are sometimes more easily accessible to people than self-direction and universalism and so it can be a good place to start especially if universalism values are um are feeling a bit dry you're feeling like you've you've talked about those so often it can be a, a different route in um, spot on. Yeah, I'd also name that because um, yeah, obviously that's something we're always thinking about as communicators. That sometimes you don't even have to name values specifically. It's more the like show don't tell. So you know, you'd say something like everyone deserves a second chance rather than naming forgiveness as a value. So definitely, um, yeah, often it is about framing. Yeah, one hundred percent. Cassia, if you have a hand up. Yes, thank you. Uh, thank you, Ruth, for the presentation and then uh, the coming remarks. Uh, it was very enriching. I'm educated in communication, so the uh, topic of values is not new to me, although the mapping is, is, is great. I, I find it uh, really helpful. But I'm wondering um, about one thing. I'm, I'm working in a plant-based campaign. So uh, we're promoting uh, the plant-based food and the theory of change is that we are aiming at the um corporate um world you know we're trying to replace the animal products with the plant-based products and it's quite a new topic for me as before i was interacting more with you know individual people than with the co corporate outreach communication and in terms of these values i'm wondering because it seems more intuitive to actually speak to this um audience with uh extrinsic values, you know, of like profit, uh, market, etc. And I know that that there are uh, people behind the, um, the, the, the corporate uh, identities. Um, but still, I find it challenging to, to find the right language. And that's why I'm looking for uh, knowledge and, and sources to, to approach that topic. So I'm wondering if you maybe have some thoughts on that or, or, or some experience. Yeah, brilliant. Um, great question, Cassia. And it, it comes up without fail um, every time every time I talk to people about about values um, is is kind of this makes sense. But what about this particular group of people or what about this particular audience? Like we have to speak to them in extrinsic ways because that is is that's their motivation. Um, um, there's a couple of things to, to bear in mind here, I think. There's a big difference between um, public communication, so public facing communications that seep in into the kind of public consciousness and help um, reinforce the, that kind of cultural surround, the cultural waters that we all swim in every day. Um, there is a difference between comms like that and comms that are behind closed doors. So if you are working with, um, I don't know, the finance, the chief financial officer, at um, a big supermarket, um, they might be sort of professionally constrained to be thinking about profit and to be thinking about things that, that potentially fall into that achievement and power category. Maybe they're thinking about the brand risk for the organization. They're thinking about their success as a company, what their stakeholders, what their shareholders are going to think, et cetera. Now, you might decide that you need to speak to them in an extrinsic way, but that is happening kind of behind closed doors in a meeting room. Um, uh, and that's kind of contextual to the conversation. It's not necessary. It's not the kind of public facing comms. Um, that's my first point. So I think there is there is a there is always a sense of, you know, what risk do we want to, to weigh up here? Um, and I think occasionally we're working with individuals who are professionally constrained to be thinking about extrinsic values and we need to then engage them through extrinsic means. Um, but that can happen without the public facing kind of comms of the work uh, being extrinsically motivated. You can, you can frame everything else to all of the other audiences intrinsically. Um, and have that kind of closed door meeting with whoever you might need to. Um, the other thing I would say, and 
people sort of roll their eyes sometimes with this, but I I kind of I do believe it's really powerful. Um, is that people in those roles are people who have perhaps been drawn to that role because they um, place a lot of power, uh, because they place a lot of um, priority on those extrinsic values. Or they can be someone that, you know, found themselves in that sort of role, in that type of job. And because they are having to engage with those values every day, they become stronger for them. Um, There has been instances uh, where people in those sorts of roles have come forward and said, I found it so refreshing to be spoken to like an individual um, and reminded of these things that I care about that actually my job gives me little room to explore. So an example of this is um, Nick Clegg, who was a senior politician here in the UK. He was taken on, uh, so an environmental organisation was wanting him to to bring in a particular policy to uh, try and pass a particular policy through our, our government. And he they'd been campaigning for years to get this to happen. Um, and he'd been really, really reluctant. Um, he was eventually invited to go for a walk in, in a forest, in a protected natural area um, here near, near London. And it, it engaged intrinsic values for him. He was out in nature, which in and of itself is proven to be this kind of intrinsic experience. We're able to be reminded of how much we love our natural world. And he he found that a truly transformative experience. And this policy, he he backed this policy after years of campaigning work. Um, And that was because he suddenly was connected on that level as a a sort of human being. So I'm not saying that that always works and it's not going to always work. And, you know, it really depends on who the person is and what the context is, et cetera. But I think that we're, we're quite often so quick to um, cancel out the possibility of talking to people in, in a different way because it's not what we normally do, that um, uh, we miss opportunities there. So yeah, that that was something and um, and also highlights the, the importance of experience, that it's not just comms um, where our values are engaged. Our values are engaged all day, every day um, by, by kind of, you know, walking through the world that we live in, um, engaging in the world that we, where, you know, we all inhabit. So if you can find ways to engage people that kind of go beyond comms as well, that also can be very, very powerful. Thank you.